Hey, good afternoon. This is the Chicago Horn Loudspeaker guys again. My name is Quinn Lee with my good friend Tom Brennan. We're going to introduce the third episode of our series on horn speakers. Um, so for this episode, we actually were very encouraged by what happened with the first two episodes and all the useful comments we received. But Tom here, uh, well actually both of us, want to respond to some of the comments that we receive on the history of movie sound. So well, there, there was one comment the, the guy was criticizing because we're talking about uh, mostly two-way systems going back to the voice of the theater. That's what we've been talking about. Right. And he's saying how you know, modern movies, uh, they got the three-way, four-way and everything, and, and it just doesn't pertain to home use. Nobody's going to put a, very few people are going to put a, mo a monstrous four-way or three-way JBL uh, sound system in the home. And actually, I'm of the opinion that the old voice of the theaters, uh, the old sound systems sound better anyway. I remember uh, back in the late 50s, 1960s, into the early 70s, going to see the big 70 millimeter spectacle movies that had six channel magnetic sound coming through Altex and uh, it sounded great and several years ago I went down to Champaign when Roger Ebert was still alive he was oh, yeah. doing a showing of Lawrence of Arabia at a big old movie palace in Champaign and I talked to the sound uh, guy I talked to the engineer of the theater and he said he was using uh, big Altec voice in the theaters, uh, and he had put new diaphragms oh, in, in the 288 drivers, and he was using constant directivity horns rather than the multicellular horns. But he, we were hearing two-way Altec sound uh, through Lawrence of Arabia, and I'll tell you, it, it was uh, the fe fella Harris that had uh, restored the movie was there, and they flew in two crack projectioners from Hollywood to make sure that the movie looked as good as it could look. And Harris said, in a little talk before they put on the movie, that he never saw it looking better. And when the movie came on, people were actually ooing and eyeing in their seats. You know, the scenes of the desert, people were going, oh, you can hear them. You know? So, uh, I'm off on a tangent, but it's a, it's a good one. But uh, we're talking in the home. And the two-way horn systems work very well in the horn, in our opinion, and yeah. in the opinion of a lot of people. Yeah, especially when you get these two-way systems, Altep systems, on pretty cheap, relatively speaking. Yeah. Compared to the modern speakers, like that's that's. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna pay five figures yeah. for a lot of these modern speakers. So that's a good segue, Tom. Uh, so before we go on with our main topic, which is the Super Santanas, uh, a speaker that's been much maligned on many online forums, we want to discuss the pros and cons of horns, why Tom and I became fans. Um, so we have, you know, obviously JBL, we have Altap, we have Klipsch. Paul Klipsch in particular uh, presented what he believed to be the main advantage of horns. And I think Tom and I have a lot of experience with, with speakers from all three companies. So I'm going to let Tom go ahead and discuss the pros and cons of horn systems. Well, I think the main advantage of horns is dynamics and, and immediacy. Uh, there's, uh, there's just a sense that things are coming at you easier, that more alive sound. I, I just had some Harbeth speakers and uh, I think most people would agree that the Harbeth is an excellent uh, example of your conventional small box uh, two-way hi-fi speaker, cone and dome speaker. Yep. And they had good tone and uh, they did the imaging trick, you know, oh, it's, a, you know, they did all that. But I had to turn them considerably louder to hear deep into the music, to hear the clarity. They, they didn't have the clarity that came alive. And I was using a, uh, a good amplifier, a 75 watt channel Hagel amplifier. Alan Shaw, the guy that makes the Harbeth, he uses Hagel amplifiers, it, it shows. So they, they were being driven properly and uh, they sounded good. But when I hooked up the Santanas or the Altex that I had before I had the Harbeth, I had Altex 604Es, 
go, there was more clarity at lower levels. And that's important in an apartment. And people say, well, the dynamics. Well, I can't use the dynamics, but I can use the clarity. And, uh, and the all have other thing. dynamics too, right? You mean, uh, one of the reasons I, I like horns in the younger days is I think a lot of us grew up as rock music fans. We want to crank it up and really feel the guitar, feel the bass, and, and so forth. And back then, uh, only horns can do that. I, there are a few JBL models that people love, mm -hmm. like the L100, but yeah. at the end of the line, if you want that live feeling, Clip Cherisees and Clip Shorns. Well, the clip first shorns. time I heard Clip Shorns, and that was at the, uh, the Hi Fi Hutch. Oh, Roosevelt, yeah, yeah. Roosevelt Road. I missed that story. <laughs> <laughs> but the first time I heard him, I was knocked over. Oh, God, yeah. It was a religious experience for yeah. me, too. Yeah. And yeah. I, I was messing around uh, with things. I had some, some speakers where I had 15-inch uh, JBL uh, D140s that were, yeah. that were out of a uh, Fender Dual Showman bottom. The guy had been playing bass through them. And I had those in, in big boxes, and I had a horn tweeter from Radio Shack on top of that. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, those JBLs can beat you up. And uh, yeah, it was pretty, you know, pretty good sound. Yeah. But yeah. it was nothing like, uh, you know, the clip short just knocked me over. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, nowadays, to get uh, that same experience, I think you got to buy the MBL 101s or the big Wilson audio speakers. And uh, those, those are five six figure speakers oh in yeah upper five yeah. so we're, we're tom and i we're talking about stuff that hundreds and thousands not you know in the stratosphere where retired guys like him and i uh could actually afford so yeah no i i am and, not and i just don't see that much machinery in those speakers i mean you can go you know buy a 400 horsepower ford crate motor you know <laughs> <laughs> with all kinds of moving parts and, and precisely machined and the thing makes 400 horsepower and, yeah. and it's cheaper than a lot of speakers. Yeah, 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 I guess what we're trying to say is the bottom line for us is the horn's ability to, to give you the feeling of listening to a live performance and get you close to the music subjectively. Uh, that, that's the reason why I'm a big horn fan. Joe Roberts, uh, the guy who used to run the magazine Sound Practices, which was a big magazine uh, with hornies and with uh, SET tube amp guys, but he said uh, he put speakers in two categories, uh, you are there and they are here. <laughs> and I think that the, the horn speakers, a good horn speaker falls into the category of they are here. Yep. When, I, yep. when I had A5s in my basement, I'll take A5s in my basement. I would play Booker T and the MGs, Green Onions. Oh, yeah, that's classic. And it was like the band was in the basement. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's a good point because, you know, I've had friends over and listen to these Altep Voice of the Theaters, and everyone's comment was pretty universal. It sounds like the performers is in the room with you. Sinatra sounds like he's in front of you. The yeah. band sounds like they're playing in front of you. I guess that's the bottom line. So, a lot of reasons, a lot of good reasons to, to be horn fans if you can afford the space. Yeah. But uh, there are a lot of people online that hate horns. So, I'm going to let Tom go into that a little bit. <laughs> Reason for why people hate horns. Well, when a horn is bad, it's really bad because you're playing it a lot louder than, than a direct radiator that's bad. It's <laughs> one thing. And there are some, some bad horns out there. there. There are some horns that have, have problems. Uh, resonances and stuff and some people say that they don't image and do the sound staging trick as as well as direct radiators they have not heard the right horns well that's that's the thing and some people uh, think they have a horny cup mouth sound kind of a thing you know you cup your mouth but you know you're when you when you cup just your mouth it's like sticking an equalizer up at, at 500 cycles. I mean, you're, you're not given a full range. If you talk to a horn that was 40 feet long, it might sound, sound natural. Bruce Edgar used to uh, uh, go around and he would have a Tractrix paper horn and he would have an exponential horn. And when he talked through the exponential horn, you could hear some coloration. And when he talked through the Tractrix horn, you didn't. Yeah. So horns vary a lot. 
And like I said, when they're bad, they can be really bad. So you have to seek out the good ones. But yeah. Uh, yeah. to pick a horn speaker, or, uh, there's, you know, a lot of people don't like Klipsch speakers. And I tell them, well, to judge all horns by Klipsch's is like judging all direct radiators by the... Uh, by the things they sell at Costco, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or bows, all right? Everybody wants oh, to pick man. on bows, so we'll pick on bows. We're going to get beat up for that last comment, but that's Although okay. I, I <laughs> never heard of bows that made me want to leave the room. They, they, they got the tone thing pretty good. But, yeah, I've heard good and bad speakers of all types, except the electrostats. I never heard an electrostat I didn't like. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, people have... Acknowledge some of these issues with horns, you know, shoutiness, the nasality, and so forth. And engineers and scientists alike have tried to figure out the reason why that is. You know, we talk about float distortion, uh, compression ratios. There is a, a, a fellow that did a PhD dissertation on the horn mouth reflection as being the cause of the, the, some of the distortion and some of the reasons why people dislike horns. And so in the future episodes, Tom and I hopefully will give you some examples on people's efforts on, on addressing that. And I think you'll be impressed. I think you'll be impressed. I mean, there's track fix horns, as Tom mentioned. You know, we have a good friend of ours with a conical horn system that sounds amazing. And we plan to go to his house in, in the near future to, to film it for you guys. And myself, I use Lecliche horns. And they, they image quite well, so I hope hopefully you guys stick with us and we'll, we'll show you some good stuff. Yeah, and uh, you know, keep the comments, you know, we, yep. we listen to what you have to say. Um, we have flaws in, in our technical presentation, we're new to this, yep. sometimes we have trouble with the sound and we're not as slick as a lot of people. I oh, like absolutely. to think we're going back to the early days of YouTube when people just had something to say and they said it and they didn't worry about whether it looked as good as a Johnny Carson show. <laughs> yeah, there's some people with nice 4K cameras that look like a TV production. We're yeah. not there yet. Yeah, we're not there, you know, but uh, we endeavor to improve. Yep. You know, hang with us. Yeah, yeah, this is a fun <laughs> channel. We're not, we're not professionals and, and this is a labor of love for us. Yeah. So... On to episode three. All right. Now that's good. <laughs>